Well, good morning. And uh, today on EV Brief, we're joined from, uh, from Austin, Texas by Teague Egan, who is the founder and CEO of Energy X. Teague, thank you so much for joining me this morning uh, or this evening, your time. Yeah, yeah. thanks for having me, John. Atik, you're an entrepreneur. You founded uh, Venture Capital uh, Fund Innovation Factory VC prior to Energy X, and you studied at USC, I believe. Um, but I think I first came across you uh, from your TEDx talk on kindness. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about your um, diverse background prior to getting into the energy space? Wow, that's uh, that's pretty cool. Not many people come across me from that, but that's that's. that's you, you've got quite a unique name, so I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I did that TEDx talk uh, a couple of years ago in Italy. It was uh, a wonderful experience um, being able to do that. But yeah, you know, I come from a family of entrepreneurs and my father was an entrepreneur. Uh, one of my grandparents was an engineer, so I kind of have that in my blood. And now with Energy X, I'm really merging those two interests, uh, engineering with entrepreneurship and, and building this company around the energy transition. That's awesome. Now, Bolivia is a special place for you, I understand, for a number of reasons. Um, tell us about how the Energy X uh, story began there. Yeah, it's a remarkable story. I mean, uh, I'm a big traveler. I've been to over 70 countries now. And Bolivia is, is one that's definitely on the, un, on the untraveled trail. You know, it's... Uh, not many people <laughs> go to Bolivia, right? But when I travel, I like to go to the far, far and hard to get places. And uh, I was traveling in South America and my, my journey took me to Bolivia and the salt flats specifically in Bolivia, which are some of the world's largest salt flats. And it was here that I discovered that this salt flat in Bolivia is actually the world's largest lithium reserve. Um, and that just, you know, piqued my interest. I, I had been a Tesla owner, uh, vehicle owner since 2013, but I had never really wondered where lithium came from and, and where the, the battery materials came from. And here I was standing right in the middle of like the source, you know, it was just an incredible feeling. Um, you know, I felt like I was standing in the middle of Saudi Arabia uh in the 1950s like as oil was being discovered um so that's that was that was my aha moment and that's kind of you know i start every company that i start based on a problem not a product and the problem that i saw was this big uh supply demand imbalance for lithium uh, a big shortage we need a lot more lithium uh, to be able to manufacture the batteries for electric vehicles. And there was no real good way to do that. The, the existing methods of production are really slow, uh, really inefficient, and, and very outdated. They, uh, there hasn't been any innovation in lithium production just because we haven't needed it. We haven't needed it until, until right now. Um, so that's really the problem that I was looking for a solution around. That's, that's great. Uh, look, many uh, listeners in Australia may not have heard of Energy X. Obviously, a lot of people in the Northern Hemisphere have. Um, so expand on that a little for me. What is it and what are you trying to do? Tell us a little bit about uh, the nanotechnology that uh, your, your company is developing and how you're going to improve extraction uh, with lithium. So when I look at lithium extraction, uh, particularly brine resources, which is where they get... Um, a little bit more than 50% of lithium, uh, they use these huge evaporation ponds that uh, they pump the brine into and they, they let the brine sit. And through natural evaporation, the water evaporates and, and the salts crash out and precipitate. And Not uh, very efficient, is it? It's, uh, it's you, yeah, you're just in the hands of nature. Not very efficient, is right. So I, I said, you know, th this is a natural way to separate the salts from the water, uh, but there has to be a mechanical way that we can do this, uh, uh, a way that, um, you know, is a little bit more controlled. Uh, and we've already developed our, our understanding of membrane technology for the, really the past 30 to 40 years. And 
we've gotten it to the point where we can actually create fresh drinking water out of ocean salt ocean water um through membranes we can separate all the salts from the water uh in that type of separation i said if we can do that using membranes why can't we use membranes to just mechanically separate the salts we want the lithium out of uh these salt brines and that was really the the idea and the vision that i had so we uh we make membranes which are based on you know nanotechnology membranes are very fine filters uh that filter out just the lithium and that's the lithium that we use in the batteries for electric vehicles i think that's a really interesting analogy because um, a lot of people i think when they think of lithium and nickel and manganese and things they just think of these metals that are kind of jammed into these tiny cells that somehow become batteries but like uh, desalinization or something you've actually got to extract the minerals that you need as you say through these layers and layers of membranes and I guess another thing that people don't realize when consumers are so far down the supply chain is that uh, there's a lot of energy, a lot of time, and a lot of chemicals and things that are required in traditional uh, lithium and, and minerals extraction, aren't there? So, so with your, it's called Litas uh, technology, is that right? Yeah. That's uh, Lytus, it's much, Lytus, sorry, Lytus, sorry, go on. Litas stands for lithium ion transport and separation. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're really dealing with the lithium atoms here uh, on, a, on a molecular level. Uh, that's, you know, the, the crux of lithium ion batteries is lithium. Uh, it's the lightest metal and it, it, it can come in different forms. Uh, you know, when you think about chemistry, um, it can come in a lot of different forms, right? You think about like metals like nickel and, and copper and stuff like that. But when, uh, when you melt, you can melt that and it becomes a liquid, like there's different phases of different materials, right? And lithium also uh, comes as uh, like salt molecules in, in salty salt water, like salt brine. Um, so that's, that's the area that lithium is actually found the most. Uh, so, we call our technology, our membrane technology, Litus, and uh, our membranes are able to highly um, select the lithium that's found in the salt. There's, there's a few other uh, salts that are found in salt brine, like typical table salt, your sodium chloride, uh, magnesium, potassium, um, calcium. You know, these are all salts that make up this salt brine, and you have to figure out how to separate the lithium from the rest of the impurities so that it's a pure product that can go into the batteries. Right, right. It's interesting that you bring up sodium because I think at the last Tesla battery day, Elon Musk mentioned something about using salt uh, to actually extract lithium in the United States. Is that right? Yeah, he, he did. And that was, uh, it had a lot of people in the lithium industry kind of scratching their heads. Yeah, right. Talk to uh, us about that. <laughs> you know, Elon is, the, the first rule of thumb is never doubt Elon because he's just, He's done so many things that people didn't believe were possible. Uh, so when he says something, you know, he he's also a master marketer, right? Um, a lot of people don't really recognize him for that, but just like Steve Jobs, he's a master marketer and he he's really adept at dumbing things down and making things sound extremely simple. Uh, when but he also he also prefaces that by saying like. All, all of this is extremely hard, right? People don't realize how hard it is to produce cars and, and mass manufacture the Model 3 or the Cybertruck. And he talks about going through production hell. He talks about how, how easy it is to do one small prototype, but then when you have to do it in a demo line and then a production line, like it becomes increasingly hard. So when he talked about using sodium to uh, extract lithium, People didn't really know how he was, you know, it was a very short part of battery day. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he unveiled a lot of innovation in battery day, uh, but the patent just came out on that technique, the right. lithium extraction technique that he was referring to. And he's getting his lithium from clay. So lithium can also be found in clay deposits, right? 
and he's not just using uh, table salt. He said like sprinkle table salt on and like lithium will come out. <laughs> he's using uh, a ball milling method. So like steel balls that they put all the clay in and like mill it. So there's a lot of extra process uh, that is actually behind this method that Tesla is exploring. And even when they get their final product from this ball milling uh, lithium or, or sodium chloride uh, process, it's still a very low concentration of lithium that they'll probably need a further process, potentially using a technology like ours. So you see uh, your light ass technology um, being taken up by uh, all these automakers who are now going to be getting into battery production in the United States. I think yesterday Biden just announced that uh, he's going to commit the, his administration to a 50% uh, new sales of EVs by 2030 target. So we're really going to see uh, GM, Ford uh, rapidly accelerate now, aren't we, to be EVs? Yeah, it's huge. I mean, every day I feel like there's news that comes out like that. Uh, Obviously exciting for us. Uh, totally, totally. The momentum, the, the tailwind behind us is, is uh, tremendous right now. And, you know, I'm appreciative of that. Um, uh, you, you know, it's, it's very, uh, it's promising to see kind of all of the people and all of the effort uh, that, that are getting behind this movement. Totally. I think, you know, even if you're not entirely on board with electric vehicles, as I know in the United States and Australia, there's still a lot of people who are either skeptical or they're really well and truly tied to the to the ice game. But it's just great to see that the discourse has changed so dramatically over the last two years around battery yeah. materials, technology and electric vehicles. There's stuff every day in the mainstream media, isn't there? Every day. Yeah. Every day. I mean, yeah, it's, it's phenomenal. <laughs> I guess the other side of the coin is that, um, you know, EVs, as we do know, they, they take a lot of uh, CO2 and a lot of resources to actually produce. That's just the fact of consuming um, new goods in, in this world. But people are looking towards a circular uh, battery economy, aren't they? A, a world, world where everything can be recycled. So what is it about the your, what is it about your technology that is going to help this kind of circular economy with with electric vehicles and battery technology you're really you're really nutting down to the efficiency of the process and not wasting anything aren't you yeah i mean look i think uh when people think about efficiency there's there's two things to think about here and one is what is the what is the carbon footprint for producing the product right and uh like drilling for oil and gas and, and creating gasoline or crude oil um or liquefied natural gas it has a carbon toll right right uh same with lithium uh you know people are talking about oh lithium's not that clean because you have to extract it from the earth and uh that's true, you know, and, and but we're working on how to make that process more efficient. I mean, you look at these huge evaporation ponds and they take up a big footprint and they use a lot of water. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, water is, is circular. Like you can use as much water as you want. Right, it just it, goes it, up, it, comes down. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But uh, we are taking lithium out of the ground, uh, whether it's through brine that I've talked a lot about or through hard rock mining, which is your typical like open pit, the way you would think about big, you know, dump trucks and, and tractors extracting ores and things like that. Uh, the other thing is how we use it, right? So the problem with fossil fuels is that you burn that you use them once you burn them and then and then they're gone right they're so incredibly like inefficient trouble. aren't they uh, compared to electric motors it's just most right. of the energy is just gone in heat exactly with lithium you get to use that product that yes you have you know uh emitted co2 or carbon yeah. to get it but once you have it you can use it for 20 years or, t or however long the battery lasts right and the next big step in the circular economy will be recycling of lithium and recycling of batteries in general. You know, once we have these materials that have been extracted, I think 
you know, already there are some big companies uh, like Redwood Materials Redwood, and yeah. Cycle, and, and uh, I've had some chats with big Tesla people that are talking about their recycling plans, which you, you know they have, right? <laughs> Uh, well, you know, it's, it's going to be uh, from an economic sense as well, you know, it's going to be key that these companies are able to reuse what uh, is reaching the end of its life in, in their kind of first tier products, isn't it? It's just, right. it's going to make sense. And, and then there will be environmental flow on effects uh, for good from that. Um, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, so in terms of uh, the lithium itself, uh, are you partnering with, uh, are you partnering with uh, mines around the world? Are you simply um, taking the lithium uh, from companies and processing it for them and, and sending it straight onto automakers or how's it working? Yeah, so the big lithium producers um, are our customers. Uh, we, um, I mean, you can look at it as a partnership in, in sorts yeah. because of our business model, but the big lithium producers like Aura Cobre or SQM or Albemarle, uh, these are the people that will use our technology to recover more lithium than the current methods that they're using are. Um, so th those are our first customers. We're exploring, you know, we're exploring ways that we can interact uh, and have relationships um, with battery makers and auto OEMs uh, as further downstream consumers of lithium. Sure. Uh, but for our first products, um, lithium extraction products, we work with existing lithium producers. Do you see your technology uh, kind of eventually spreading to developing countries and helping to actually reduce the, the cost of, of refining um, lithium? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, that's, that's exactly what our technology does. So. Mm -hmm. It works in, in really two ways. Uh, one is increasing the total output of lithium. So the existing pond infrastructure has uh, a relatively low recovery rate uh, of, the, of the lithium that's actually pumped up and the, the, the well feed that it goes into the first pond, right? After it goes through all the ponds, it has a recovery of X, right? We put our technology into that system. And because we have mechanical separation, we don't lose any lithium along the way. Uh, so we're, we're able to recover 3X the lithium. So wow. the lithium output is significantly more. Um, that obviously has an effect on the unit economics, meaning right. that there's per ton of lithium produced, there's a lot lower cost. Yeah, right? I mean, a 3x return on investment initially is, is huge for anyone, right, extracting the, the material. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so how important to you is sustainability as well in terms of, I guess, what you're doing and, and sort of battery components down the line in the future? Yeah, I mean, look, that goes, that goes back to your other question yeah. about how people view, like, sustainability. And my view is that, by us uh, decreasing the cost of lithium, uh, that A, and, and increasing the abundance of lithium, uh, that puts more lithium into the circular economy that we talked about. It will decrease the cost of batteries and ultimately electric vehicles, which batteries are the biggest cost, um, and, and, and make, electric vehicles more prominent, which decreases carbon footprint. Uh, so for that reason and that reason alone, you know, we're, we're uh, a very sustainable company. You know, our whole mission is to improve sustainability and decrease carbon footprint. And by having more lithium and more batteries and more electric vehicles, that's exactly what we're doing. Right. I think a lot of people, obviously, they think of Tesla when they're thinking about accelerating the world to sustainable energy, but it's got, it's got to happen at all levels uh, with every company in the energy space and, and vehicle space, hasn't it? Um, like, like yours. Yeah, I mean, Tesla is such a, an extraordinary story because, they, you know, they've been working on this since 2002, right? So almost 20 years. And that's why they've been able to build out, 
I mean, it's a very long supply chain. Like people yeah. buy a car, they don't think about the, the car is made of thousands of different pieces with extended supply chains behind those pieces, right? Uh, like windshields, you know, the windshield maker has a supply chain behind them. Right, right? all the silicon, all the parts in that, yeah. And everybody that provides the materials for the windshield has supply chain behind them. So it's a very built out supply chain. And it's one of the reasons that you, you think about why can't GM or Ford, why, why is it taking so long for all these companies to transition to electric vehicles? It's the future. Tesla has two times the market valuation or the, the market cap of mm. all these other companies combined. And, and the reason is because they have spent the time to not only build their supply chain, but also in a lot of instances, vertically integrate their supply yeah. chain. So they own really far down that supply chain. And in the case of like batteries, right? They, they created battery supply chain for electric vehicles. It just didn't exist. And uh, a big part of that is lithium and they're, they're buying a lot of the lithium. <laughs> There's not enough lithium to go around for every car manufacturer. <laughs> Right, and it, exactly. It's going to come down to simple supply and demand. And I think yeah. that's why a lot of people, when they think of Tesla, originally they were everyone scratching their heads going, oh, why is this company, why are they making their own seats? Why are they doing their own batteries? Why are they doing their own sound system? You know, there's all these other uh, OEM suppliers who can do that for them. But now everyone's seeing just how, how dynamic and agile a company can be when you've got that vertical integration, when you've got all the technology and R&D in-house, aren't they? Um, yeah. So, so also while we're on Tesla, let's let's quickly talk about the the new cells that are coming out, the forty six eighty cells. Um, there's a lot of talk about new gigafactories and these cells specifically um, with their improved cell structure. Uh, I guess improved energy density and the ability for electrons to kind of sort of flow faster through these new cells. When do you think we're going to see this technology come out? Um, I think that. Tesla is trying to use 4680s in some of the Model Y and Cybertruck. Uh, you know, Tesla, their whole business is based on the batteries. That's their, that's their biggest competitive advantage. Uh, you know, we talked about the seats and the windshield and the sound system. Like, there are a lot of other suppliers for that. Like, granted, they want to, you know, control a lot of those aspects. Um, but the batteries are far and away their differentiator. And they spend a lot of time and effort and research into, you know, why is the battery, uh, it started out as an 1860, uh, right? Or an mm -hmm. 18600. And then it went to a 2170. And, and, and they said, why, why is it like this? What are the most efficient uh, ways to, to increase energy density. And, you know, they, they said, why does it have a tap? They basically broke it down to first principles, which is what Elon's known for. And they built it back up using first principles. And they said, can the can, can the can be this big? Like, can it be, you know, uh, 46 um, in, I think it's 46 millimeters in diameter and uh, 80, 80 millimeters in height. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're what what Energy X is thinking about is, I want to uh, you know we have a we have a battery initiative at Energy X and we want to mold our solid state battery work into uh, the format that Tesla is providing. There's there's a lot of other battery companies out there uh, like Solid Power, uh, Solid Energy Systems, QuantumScape. They're all going for the pouch cell. Yep. Uh, because that's just what that's just what people think that solid state batteries have to be. Yep. And I'm my, my approach is saying Tesla is going to use 4680 cells in their cars. It's it's how they've designed uh, the 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 structure of the actual car. The batteries are the structure. It's kind of like I don't know. You you watched the whole battery day, obviously, and you saw where. Uh, they compared their battery cells to the airplane wing, where instead of the gas tank uh, going inside the wing, the wing actually became the gas tank, right? 
that's the same thing for Tesla. The, the battery cells are actually becoming the structure of the car as opposed to putting batteries into uh, the base of the car. So if 4680 cells are gonna be what Tesla uses, we want to make our solid state batteries fit inside the jelly roll canister of a 4680. So, um, you know, I'm following Tesla wholeheartedly in that. And I think that, you know, these are just engineering problems and that's what, that's the type of team that Elon has built uh, to be a great team. Just and it's, technology risk is behind, it's just engineering. Right, right. And that's, that's perfect. Actually, you kind of led into the next thing I want to talk about, which was solid state and your energy initiative. So, you know, everyone is talking about solid state. I think a lot of people don't really understand the technology. They don't really know who the players are. Um, I think we've got Daimler, we've got BMW, Toyota, everyone's kind of looking at the technology, but we don't have a, a timeline, I think, for consumers as to when we're going to start to see them. So what, what's the lead time with uh, solid state batteries? So solid state, let me just kind of quickly give a little background yeah, sure. on what solid state is. So current lithium ion batteries uh, have three main components, uh, two electrodes, one is the anode, one is the cathode, uh, and then something that separates them. And the lithium travels back and forth from the anode to the cathode through this uh, separation. Or a the, separator, yeah. Yeah, the separator. And, and currently in lithium ion batteries, that separator is made of like a, like a gel or liquid electrolyte. Um, because you can't have the two electrodes touch each other. That's what causes thermal runaway and it will burst into flames and, and set on fire, right? In a solid state battery, that liquid becomes a solid state separator, which takes up a lot less space um, and can allow for more lithium in the battery, which more lithium equals more energy density. The more lithium you have, uh, the more energy the battery can hold at a lighter weight because lithium is the lightest metal. That's why we use lithium in batteries because it holds energy and it's really light. Um, so making that separator uh, solid, uh, something that's non-flammable so it can't catch on fire, it just needs to make sure that the two electrodes don't touch each other, right? Um, so that's kind of the next uh, generation of batteries that a lot of people are working on. And I think it's close, you know, these, these companies that uh, a lot we've seen go public like QuantumScape and solid power and solid energy systems, etc. cetera. Um, they're, they're all backed by the big automotive companies like BMW, GM, Volkswagen, etc. cetera. Uh, I think it's right around the corner. You know, I like to compare uh, energy storage and battery research to pharmaceutical uh, research. So pharmaceutical companies are known to put an exorbitant amount of money into their research. I think like someone told me that 15% of pharmaceutical companies budget goes into research for developing new drugs. And these drugs cost like billions of dollars to, to develop. Um, 1% of energy companies put money into new research and development. Like you think about Exxon, the, 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 the traditional big energy companies like Exxon and, and Chevron, like oil and gas, that's where energy has been. They don't put any money into new R&D, right? It's, it's, they it's, put, it's they lazy. Put, <laughs> yeah, they, they, they produce oil and gas. Like they probably put money into lobbyists to stop these battery. I mean, yeah. you know that how much yeah. they put into yeah. stopping Tesla, right? That's that's well documented. But like, why? You know, now there's Samsung and LG and like some other bigger bigger battery companies. But th those those are conglomerates that LG makes washing machines and TVs, and Samsung makes cell phones and and yeah. you know what what may have you. The actual battery and energy storage part hasn't really had that much research and development capital go into it. Now, in the past five years, it is exploding. So when you think about uh, the, the exponential curve that battery technology is about to see, it's, we're going to see huge, huge strides 
maybe not maybe not Moore's lost strides where like computer computers and, and data doubles every every mm. so many years but we're going to see vast improvements in battery technology in the coming in the coming future yeah interesting and i guess linking it all together um the as you say you know weight is key solid state is moving towards less weight more density and that is also going to have an effect on cost and and hitting well below that hundred dollar per kilowatt hour uh, target that everyone's talking about isn't it and it's also going to hopefully improve energy security and accelerate clean energy across the world, including developing nations. Uh, I think a lot of people talk about, oh, EVs, you know, they're not accessible by people uh, in, in Africa, or across the Middle East, across Asia, because they're just too expensive. But this technology is going to drive uh, clean energy into the hands of all consumers, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, we're at, we're at the, we're in the first inning right now. Right. Uh, Tesla might be in the second inning. <laughs> But uh, there's a long way to go. I mean, we may not need batteries that can travel a thousand miles, but like that's, you know, imagine if your battery could travel a thousand or 2000 miles or something like a lithium air battery where range was just never a problem or, you know, that's, that's for like a big Model S or like a sedan. If you could pack that into a small smart car, imagine if your smart car could go 500 miles. Right. Right. <laughs> and let's see, the density is going to be key. I think everyone's talking range this and range that. And we're seeing a lot of Chinese automakers come out with these uh, 150 kilowatt hour batteries and things like that for a thousand kilometers or like 700 miles range. But it's going to be it's going to be a density game, I think, because there's also the environmental impact around these things as well. I think consumers, we simply don't need a car that can just go a thousand miles in one trip because no one can actually physically really do that. But there yeah. are going to be applications across transportation about making passenger vehicles uh, lighter as well uh, for around town. That's going to be huge. But it's it's a uh, it's a balance. Like the balance. We, we don't necessarily need a car that can go five hundred or a thousand miles on a charge if you have the charging infrastructure, right? Which True. Tesla has done a great job of building in the U.S. and throughout Europe and parts, but there's still limited, very limited charging infrastructure. And sometimes lines at Tesla supercharging stations can back up. And that's even not allowing any other automotive maker to use their stations. Right, Think right. Think about Africa. If we want Africa to have accessibility to electric vehicles and they have no charging infrastructure, that's when you start needing to have longer range uh, EVs. Yeah, totally. So what's the lead time um, with your technology? What are we talking for Energy X in terms of uh, getting to market? Uh, so right now, we're about to deploy our pilot plants into the field uh, with some, some big lithium customers. Uh, next year, and those will run for about six months to ensure long duration testing and stability of the technology in real world environments. Uh, after that, we'll move to demonstration phase, which is, um, uh, again, uh, like a self-containerized unit that just has bigger stacks of our technology, um, more surface area of our membranes that can process uh, more. But those stacks uh, are full commercial units. Um, well, how we think about commercialization is multiplying those stacks times 100 or times 200. So we're, we're looking at a very modular approach where we want to test commercial size stacks as our demonstration units, but just one or two of them. That doesn't really produce the, like quant large quantities of lithium, but it still is the commercial stack. Mm -hmm. And then the way that you produce more lithium is just multiply those stacks times, you know, however much lithium you want to produce. That's amazing. I think yeah, the, the moduli modularization of uh, manufacturing of extraction, this is really going to be a game changer, isn't it? In the future, we're seeing EV manufacturers look to modular factories to save weight and have smaller footprints. Um, so this is really something new in lithium extraction, isn't it? I don't think, is anyone else doing doing this? You know, uh, they might they might be trying to copy me from the podcast that I do, but... <laughs> You know, that's, that's how we, that's how we're trying to approach it. I don't, I don't try to think about what our, you know, I obviously want to be aware of our competitors, but like, we're very focused on uh, our 
approach and yeah. uh, what we think is, is yeah. the way to market. Yeah. So I guess bigger picture, what do you see as the key threats globally over the next, say, one to two decades when it comes to energy and, and climate? Um, you know, I think that as a civilization and humanity, we know that the energy transition is is good for everybody. Um, a big threat that I see is uh, red tape regulations. Um, you know, this this may not be what what a lot of people want to hear, but down in the Atacama Desert, where uh, the biggest lithium producers in the world are, Albemarle and SQM. Uh, they have they have huge evaporation ponds and they produce the lithium there and we're trying to make that a little bit more environmentally friendly by reducing the footprint etc but i'll read articles um talking about how we're damaging like some of the most pristine uh ecosystems and you know these are literally like barren deserts of the harshest conditions uh, in the beating sun. And, and, you know, the fact that people could say, oh, this is like a pristine environment and we can't, like, these are in like, like dry desert mountain ranges. And we're, you know, I, you know, pe people may not like that rhetoric or that line of thinking that I just explained to you, but I think that regulation around that, uh, could could be a threat to the energy transition. Um, it's, it's hard, isn't it? I mean, you know, it's it's always a case of technology being well ahead of laws and regulation, right? And it's really going to have to come down to, I guess, the international community and regulators to step up and and find this balance between the environment and and materials extraction, aren't they? And I think you know, on, on your point, obviously. Uh, somewhere like you're talking about is incredibly beautiful when it's untouched and pristine but a lot of these same people are the people who who don't mind oil drilling in the arctic circle or pipelines cutting through pristine state forest or that kind of thing you know yeah. <laughs> but, but when it comes to lithium and new technology everyone's up in arms going well we can't do this yeah basically my answer was focused towards politics i guess like there certainly is a, a, a large, like, you know, you talked about Biden earlier and a lot of politicians are uh, for, for, you know, preventing climate change. The past president, not so much. Uh, so things like that could be a threat. Uh, you never know who the next president of the United States is going to be in four years. It could yeah. delay some of the progress that, that is being made. Um, but ultimately, a lot of capital and a lot of funding and a lot of uh, hard work uh, and a lot of people are working on this problem together. Um, so, you know, I'm very optimistic and hopeful for the future. One major issue that we've seen, uh, particularly in Australia and with the Trump administration, is that uh, policy certainty is needed and is key for actually driving innovation and driving investment from, from the energy sector, isn't it? And you really you really need that to, to get things going with with clean energy yeah i mean that's certainly true uh you know but as as much as i disapproved and really despised of of trump and and everything that he stood for i'm i'm reading uh we actually have a book club here at energy x and we're reading the the biography of thomas edison and mm. You know, this is this is a very cliche thing to say, but the only permanent thing that that is always permanent is change, and the change from from Obama to uh, Trump, and then from Trump to Biden, uh, I think in in a way is healthy. The 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 way that things can be balanced, like if it's if it's just Obama to another Democrat to Biden. And it just stays in that like kind of very, very liberal type uh, mindset totally. that, that things will kind of skew so far 
off of a level playing course that, you know, Trump, Trump did bring a lot of, a lot of deregulation around government, uh, where there may be so many levels of government, uh, before in like a democratic or almost even like socialistic way that, uh, it, it hinders capitalism. Um, so you have to have kind of a balance in ideology around sure, that. Sure, sure. Uh, but I mean, you know, for certain industry policy is obviously good, uh, but it obviously didn't affect the way that Tesla grew. <laughs> I'll tell you that, right? Well, that's right. It was like, just taken down. Well, I mean, I guess there are, there are a few hairy moments. Man. There are a few hairy right. moments where Trump was tearing up trade agreements and, and wreaking havoc across the rest of the world that must have had Elon uh, up all night. Yeah. But, uh, and I guess, you know, there's a difference between, I guess, balance and, and multiple sides to just kind of Trump just tearing everything up and just yeah. destroying a lot of regulation. But uh, look, yeah. finally, finally, Teague, just a bit of a, a personal question. What's, what's been the most rewarding part of the journey with Energy X for you? Um. I think that it's the small wins uh, as an entrepreneur and any entrepreneur that's listening to this can relate. There are ups and downs every day. You know, there are, there's been a hundred times where I've wanted to quit or thought about quitting and, and it's to be an entrepreneur. You can't, you don't need encouragement from anybody. You have to be, have such a strong belief in yourself and your vision. And, uh, Every day there's ups and downs. Every week there's ups and downs. Every every month there's bigger ups and downs. Like you could be working on a deal for three months or six months and have it not work out. And that's a huge loss, right? You could lose your biggest customer and feel like, you know, that's the end. And you just have to stay strong because the next day there can be a there can be a big win. And then it's the small wins that add up to those big wins. So it's really the journey itself. It's the small wins along the way. Um, you know, it's, it's setting up a, a room, like, you know, in our laboratory, setting up a room that looks nice and feeling good about that. It's, it's seeing uh, your team and the pride that they have in those small wins. I think that's, that's been some of the most rewarding things for me. Uh, thanks for being so honest with us, because I think, yeah, particularly in this age of, uh, of COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it's certainly about getting down to the micro level stuff, isn't it? And, and enjoying the progress that you make, uh, yeah. even if it is incremental. I, I like, so we, uh, we're, we're finishing up our new showroom that showcases our pilots. And we, uh, we just rented this, uh, it's 5,000 square feet of showroom. Nice. And we, we ripped out the whole thing. It had a drop ceiling and it had like it was like an old stuffy like kind of place and we uh epoxied the floors and we painted the whole thing white and made it very high ceilings with black and i had uh our team work like it would it saved us a whole bunch of money for our own team to do this and we had our we had our cfo in there painting we had um, our vice president of business development out there painting. And I have some funny pictures of <laughs> your camera died, but just some, some really funny pictures. I don't know if you can see this, but he's just covered in paint. <laughs> and this is our, this is our vice president of business development. Oh, wow. And, you know, just to see him out there, uh, giving it his all and working and painting himself until you know, 10 o'clock at night and then waking up at 6 a.m. to get back at it. Like those are those are the wins and like that just make me so happy that our team is working their asses off to make the dream come true. Right. And it's, that's it. It's about surrounding yourself with like minded, good people who want to contribute to the same mission, isn't it? Yeah. Well, Teague, thank you so much for joining us on EV Brief today. We hope to eventually one day be able to come and check out the showroom, but uh, yeah. we look very much forward to following Energy X's story uh, over the next few years. Awesome. I appreciate it, John. Take care. Stay safe. All right. Take it easy, bud.